Happy New Year, Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. We're glad that you're joining us in 2021. And uh, it's been said already that this is the year where all of us now have 2020 hindsight. We made a pun at the beginning of last year that we were all living with 2020 vision. Now we all have 2020 hindsight. And uh, we'll put that year behind us and, and press forward to see what God has for us in the new year. Uh, we're excited to serve you at Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. We're praying that this year we're able to uh, meet in person again for, uh, we are, we're hoping for most of the year. Uh, obviously, we're missing out this very first Sunday, but uh, we'll continue on and we hope to see you again soon. I uh, just wanted to let you know of the couple of announcements that we have. Um, first off, Pastor Dan and I and our families wanted to say thanks for a generous Christmas gift that we got and uh, from the church, and uh, we're very grateful for it. Uh, going forward, uh, we want to remind you once again about Red Sea Rules. This is a book that we're uh, hoping that maybe you want to get, and uh, if you want to, let us know. We'll place a big order of them. Uh, again, it's got the the little... Um, secondary title is 10 God-Given Strategies for Difficult Times. And it's a small book. You can probably barely even see it when I hold it like that. It's so small. So it's not an intimidating book. Uh, it's one that any of us can read and can benefit from. We'll advertise that maybe once or twice more for you, and then we'll, we'll start advertising a new book. We want to give you good things to read uh, while many of us are sitting at home during COVID times. Uh, other than that, going forward, uh, we just want to continue to make sure you know that things are going on online. Uh, our services will still be going up every Sunday. FFBC for Kids will start up within the next week or two again. And uh, also the online Zoom Bible studies are not going to happen this week, uh, but they will start in the second full week of January here. That will be the, the Tuesday morning one and then the Friday evening one. Uh, Friday morning prayer time is still going on. Uh, so you can join us at 8 o'clock in the mornings, Friday morning, on Zoom. If you want a link, just let us know, and uh, we'd love to see you there for our Friday morning prayer meetings. That's about all that we have going on right now as we start the new year, but we're hoping that we can start to announce many more things uh, very soon. So why don't you bow with me in prayer, and then we'll read some scripture, and Pastor Dan will speak to us today. Father God, we just pray that you would bless uh, this year. Um, ultimately, Father, uh, as we look back, we can thank you that you're in sovereign control of all things. We can thank you that you give us hope and love and joy and peace. We can thank you uh, as we've just gone through the Christmas season for your son. And none of that changed no matter what happened in 2020. Uh, you're still in control. You're still on the throne. Uh, you still sent your son. He still died on the cross for us, and we can still trust in him for the salvation of our souls. And Father, that's a, a wonderful truth that we can cling to, that you do not change like the shifting shadows uh, of our lives. And so, Father, as we enter this new year, we pray that it would be one marked by a pursuit of you in our hearts, uh, that you would reveal yourselves to us in, in more grand and glorious ways, that we would study your word deeply, uh, that you would bless us as we begin a new series on First Peter today, and as we uh, begin to go through this wonderful book that you've given us, and uh, just pray that you would ultimately, again, draw near to us as we draw near to you in this year, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there, and we're going to read the first 12 verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found, 
to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Welcome to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church here in Brandon, Manitoba. We're glad that you've joined us today. And if you have your Bibles, please take them, and I hope you do, take them and turn them to 1 Peter chapter 1, the passage that Pastor Daniel just read for us. We're just looking at the first couple of verses today, but anticipating that we're laying a foundation for the book a study to come. I've entitled the message, Stand Fast in the Grace of God. R.C. Sproul says, imagine what it would be like to receive a letter from someone who was a personal friend of Jesus during his earthly ministry here. Beyond that, imagine receiving two such letters. Well, that's exactly what we have in the New Testament correspondence in the books 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Peter, in his book, is writing to Christians who are experiencing trouble and difficult times. He's encouraging them to stand firm in the grace of God. That's the theme verse, in one sense, found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. We'll refer to that at the end of the message as well. But today and for the days to come in 2021, we anticipate, as many Christians do, that we're going to have to draw strength from these pages, not just in 1 Peter or 2 Peter, but throughout the scriptures, strength for the days to come. The truths that were initially written for the first century church are still legitimate and applicable for us today here in Brandon, Manitoba. Whether you live in Brandon or whether you live anywhere around the world, you're going to go through difficult times and you're going to draw strength, as we will, from these pages. Well, some historical background to the epistles. The, the, the emperor at Peter's time in the first century was Nero, and he was feared by all. He began arresting Christians about the mid-60s A.D., Tacitus, a second century Roman historian who himself disliked Christians, I'm told, uh, recorded that Nero burned Christians alive to light up his gardens and that he fed Christians to wild, and, wild animals for entertainment. Christians in Rome in particular were routinely slandered, defamed, boycotted, mobbed, imprisoned, and killed for their faith. And even though the more global persecution of Christians around the Roman world didn't begin in earnest until the second or third centuries, we can read even in the book of Acts of many pockets of, pop, of, of localized persecutions. For example, in Acts chapter 19 of Paul uh, being brought before the crowds and some of the Christians being persecuted as he challenged their faith in Diana uh, or Artemis. We must remember as well that Paul's culture and his environment was even more hostile than ours today towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. One writer said there was nothing more hostile to the Christian church in the first century than Rome. First Peter itself covers a large variety of topics, the already and not yet nature of our salvation, meaning that we're seated in the heavenlies but we're still here on earth. Lessons about fearing God, issues of the church, spiritual gifts, how a church is to be organized, and elders, and hospitality, and evangelism, and subjection to government authority. It talks about husbands and wives, spiritual warfare, and more. It's of note that the two twin themes of God's sovereignty and the suffering of Christians are also united in this book, seen together through the whole teachings of the epistle. Jim Sammer writes, given that Peter struggled with the ideas and the notion of righteous suffering and experienced so much suffering himself to have an epistle written by him on the role of righteous suffering is truly wonderful. Furthermore, since suffering is such an integral part of every true Christian's experience, 1 Peter is an invaluable book for every believer to spend time working through, and I hope that we will find that to be true in our studies. So in reference to our own day and age, 
We sense we're heading into times of more suffering and persecution for the Christian church and individual believers than perhaps, and for individual believers than perhaps you and I here, at least in our country, have experienced before. It's important for us to remember, however, that the church has been through times like this before. The book itself was probably written between 62 and 64 AD, but within four years, Peter himself would be crucified. Church tradition tells us that he felt unworthy to be crucified as the Lord, and so he requested that he be crucified upside down. He had not represented, he felt, Christ in a worthy manner throughout his whole life. Peter himself grew up as a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. He worked for his father, Zebedee, and along with his brother, Andrew. They probably owned the company called Zebedee and Sons. That would have been on their marquee. He lived in Galilee. Uh, we know that from first John, or John chapter 1 when he met Jesus from the city of Bethsaida. So going to Jerusalem for him at any time, he would have been recognized either through his dialect or his, his speech, his clothing, as, as a country bumpkin. He was also probably a bit of a rough character. He would have been a physically strong individual, pulling in the nets of fish every day as his life worked. He would have worked long hours, had a tough exterior, would have been well weathered. He always would have smelled of fish. And, and, and by the way, Peter was married. Jesus healed his mother-in-law, we read in Matthew. So he finally found a woman who, who was okay with the smell of fish. We, my wife and I were watching a, 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 a movie recently, and one of the characters said he finally found a girl who didn't mind the smell of fish. That's what he did for a living. And so Peter found his mate. Peter walked with Jesus for three and a half years, but what we know about Peter is really only known in the Bible. Some outside sources, of course, and historical so sources, but what we do know about Peter should challenge each and every one of us on the reflection of his values in our own life. There was no one else whose successes and failures in Scripture are cataloged so completely for us. He had a name given to him by Jesus when Peter first met Jesus in, in John chapter 1, a prophetic descriptive title. He was the only man in the New Testament with that name, and Petros, Peter, the Aramaic Cephas, means stone or rock. It was later emphasized in its importance when Peter spoke his great confession in Matthew chapter 16 to Jesus, you are the son of the living God. The Lord's affirmation of Peter's declaration is quite significant because no other apostle is ever singled out by the Lord for such words, although all of them would be part of the foundation of the church. In the, first, in, the first, in the four Gospels, Peter is noted as being the primary spokesman of the twelve. He's always listed first in the four lists that are given to us in Scripture. He was the only one of the twelve to accept the Lord's invitation to walk on water. He was the first of the apostles to declare that Jesus was the Christ. In John chapter 21, G Peter alone is singled out by the Lord to feed his sheep. And Peter was a, a well-known and, and primary spokesman for the church in the book of Acts. More than likely, he also had a strong influence on Mark, as Mark wrote his gospel. Peter received his own individual resurrection appearances before the other apostles. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, Peter was recognized by Paul as holding a unique position among the, the apostles. Peter clearly was the lead apostle in the book of Acts, and he was mentioned by name in the New Testament more than any other single person except Jesus Christ himself. And although it's been said at times that sometimes Peter only opened his mouth to change his feet, Sproul writes, Peter is the one who testifies beyond speculation as one who was an eyewitness, testifying not to cleverly devised myths or fables, but to that which he had seen with his eyes and heard with his ears. This is the testimony of a man who not only was part of the entourage of Jesus during his earthly ministry, but he was an eyewitness of the resurrection and part of the inner circle of disciples in that great triad of, of Peter, James, and John. These three were present on the Mount of Transfiguration as well and were able to see with their own eyes the glory of the transfigured Christ. And in his first message after the resurrection and ascension of the Lord and after his own restoration to the ministry through, his post, through the post-resurrection encounters with Jesus, in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were led to the Lord as Peter preached about Christ crucified as him being the Savior and Lord. What a remarkable transformation of a spirit and a character from his denials at the fire during the trial of Jesus to being the spokesman for the early church. And it's noted in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, in particular, that he and John were uneducated and common, and, and common men. 
indicating that they were not recognized as having studied under the scribes and the Pharisees and the scholars of the day as the Apostle Paul. But it was also noted that they were fearless and outspoken in the early church. And Acts chapter 4 verse 13 again says it's because they had been with Jesus. Imagine such uneducated, rough and uncultured men used by God in such a, a mighty way. There's hope for all of us. Please remember that God is not impressed with our education, with our strength, uh, our physical ability, or our wealth. We read that in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Instead, God loves to take the simple things and the simple people of life, to anoint them with his spirit, many that the world would consider losers or left-behinds or good-for-nothings or just average people, and he uses them to turn their worlds upside down. That can be true for you and for me. It's important to remember that God wants to use anyone whose hearts and lives are right with him. And as we start 2021, mark this verse down if you haven't already in your Bibles. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a great goal that would be for you and I to have that verse impressed and imprinted on our hearts. And that we would remember who the Lord is looking for and what kind of people he was willing to use, wanting to use. Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, as Pastor Daniel read, we start off with the writer, the readers, and the greeter. That's a typical way that letters were started at that time. You identified who you were as you wrote, you identified who you were writing to, and then you sent them a greeting. Well, we've talked a little bit about the writer already, Peter. What we see in the Bible is that Peter grows in his faith. Don't ever forget that. Peter started off like so many who come to know the Lord, and they didn't. They were they're common, uneducated in the terms of Scripture, and yet God teaches them, his, uh, and they grow in their faith. By the time of the writing of his letters to the churches, Peter had become strong, firm, and steadfast in his faith and his faithfulness to the Lord in his ministry. He had become someone the early church could believe on and rely on, and they could gain support and insights from his own personal times of suffering. He was a very public and prominent figure in the early church, yet a humbled man in many ways. As one who himself had been humbled people, Peter would encourage others to be humble before the Lord, and together they would be like Christ. And so as one who was initially more of a stumbling block to the Lord, to the Lord uh, Peter became a more foundational rock for both the Lord and the church. Peter became what we would call a rock-solid Christian. He notes himself to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle, the basic, mean, the basic meaning of the word is one who was sent forth by another on a mission. It's used a couple of different times in the scriptures to, return, to refer to Epaphroditus, who was a messenger or an apostle in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Titus and the other delegates or apostles of the church, as they were sent out in 2 Corinthians 8, to gather as official representatives of the church, the offerings being sent to those in, uh, in, uh, in need in Palestine. And it's used of Paul and Barnabas as missionaries sent out to the church. But here Peter uses it, I believe, in the more official restricted sense, one chosen and commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. Paul was an apostle then of Jesus Christ, not of his own, like the false apostles we, we uh, talked about and, and studied in 2 Corinthians as we went through that book. But Peter was directly commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is a, is a Hebrew form of the, the word jo Joshua, and it means salvation of Jehovah. It's the name of Jesus' humanity. It's the Jesus that Peter met uh, through his ministry initially, and as he walked with him, he got to know that Jesus was a real flesh and blood type person. But he was also not just Jesus, but Jesus Christ. A translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, uh, which means the anointed one. And Peter and the early church came to recognize and speak of their belief that the human Jesus was indeed the anointed Messiah, the Savior of the world. So we, write, we read about the, the writer, we study him. We, we read about the readers now in verses 1 and 2, and, and Peter addresses them initially as God's elect strangers in the world. This opening statement translates just three Greek words, and yet one writer suggested Peter uses these three strong nouns to describe his audience, elect exiles of the dispersion. And these three words undergird and support almost everything else that Peter wants to say in his letter to the struggling, suffering Christians. 
United by faith with Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, elect and precious, they constituted an elect race. We read that in chapter 2. As God's elect people, they formed a group separate and distinct from the world and subject to its hatred and persecution. And D. Edmund Hebert continues, he says, In themselves they were just ordinary people, again, not superior to their unsaved neighbors, but the initiative of God made them what they were. See, the term elect simply means selected or chosen. And throughout the Bible, chosen is an intimate term, more often, most often used of speaking of whom God loves. He, the doctrine of election is, what one writer said, is a, is a family truth. It's written to strengthen and encourage believers in their affliction. It's the first mention in the book of 1 Peter that connects us with the truth of God's sovereignty. Because the point is, those who are believers in Jesus Christ as Christians are because God chose them to be believers in Jesus Christ. It's something that Peter would have learned from the Lord himself as Jesus often reminded them, I have chosen you. Now to understand the doctrine of election is, is more than I can handle in one message. And it's actually a biblical teaching that the human mind cannot fully comprehend. And yet this particular doctrine is taught in scripture to confirm and to comfort uh, Christians, to help us, to encourage us, to, uh, to, to challenge us uh, as to God's understanding God's love more. But it unfortunately has been the source or cause of much controversy among the saints. The Bible does not analyze or explain all the problems that our own minds create with this doctrine and other difficult teachings in the scriptures, nor does the Bible attempt to harmonize the truth with other great truths uh, as revealed in our conscience or in the scriptures. For example, the freedom of the will and the sovereignty of God. But it's a doctrine and a belief and a clear teaching in, in the Bible that directs us to understand it's all about God's love and to remind the people of God of his great love towards us. Uh, one writer said, It's not a term to be waved in front of those who don't net yet know God. It should be used to bring comfort to those who do, those in their faith. Peter intended to assure his, earlier, his early dis dispersed readers of God's steadfast love, and certainly they would have basked in the reassuring strength of the word. J.I. Packer wrote a little book called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, and I read many, many years ago, and I remember that he, he called that controversy between God's free will and God's sovereignty and here election and God's free will, and he calls it an antinomy. And what that means is there's two separate truths that are legitimate on their own, but it, they seem to conflict. And he used the illustration that's been very helpful to me of a, a train, a train tracks, and Two parallel truths, and both are needed in order for the train to run properly, in order for us, to, to, in our belief and our faith, to run properly. And yet, the two tracks never seem to meet. But as you look off into the future, they seem to merge or intersect at one particular point. And as I believe Packer says in his books, and they will one day in heaven. But for now, we're to be content with these two truths that are taught in Scripture. Both emphasize the teachings from God, both real and need to be believed. And yet we have a difficulty uh, combining the two. But as we look down the tracks, as I mentioned, into the distance, they do converge as they will one day in heaven. <clears throat> and one writer said, <clears throat> These hard doctrines teach us by their silence that the proper attitude of the Christian when brought face to face with mystery is to rest in the Lord. Humble, childlike confidence in his love and wisdom are what is needed. Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine says, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one, the New Living Translation. We are not accountable for them, but we are and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us. Job said, as for me, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without numbers. Psalm 145, verse 3, part of last week's message, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. In Romans eleven thirty three, Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. But Peter himself here indicates that their election served God's purposes. That you may declare, he writes in chapter 2, verse 9, the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. 
So election, what we need to know as a believer in particular is that it involves responsibility and accountability on our part. It's a doctrine to be believed. And it's a doctrine that is designed to comfort and encourage the Christian, chosen by God for his purposes. So he writes, secondly, not only to God's elect, but to strangers in the world. Helms writes, unfortunately for Israel, they became too familiar with their election by God as God's chosen people, and they began to presume upon God's grace. As special objects of his love, Israel believed that they would always know and experience the goodness of the Lord. However, over time, their familiarity with God worked against them. They began to believe that they were entitled to the good life, as we saw in the book of Hosea, when their love and their, even when their love and their commitment to God grow, grew cold. And it was the sin of presumption that became the unfortunate companion of God's elect. As for us today, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, So let the man who feels sure of his standing today be careful that he does not fall tomorrow. We cannot presume upon the grace and the love of God, even as God's elect, we must follow through with our obedience. And over time, Israel was disciplined by God and then dispersed by God. And the term dispersion came to be connected with the word elect. However, the term strangers and sojourners and exiles that's used is used here of the church, not of Israel. It's used to describe as well people living as resident aliens among a people they do not belong to. They're regarded as non-natives in the land where they live. Christians clearly are also called to be God's people, but please note here that Christians are very distinct and unique from Israel, separate from Israel. Our dispersion here, as Peter writes, has nothing to do with Israel's sins nor our own sins. It's truly connected with our own calling, and it results even from our own obedience to that call and to the Savior. We need, as Christians, to recognize ourselves as temporary residents of this world. It's not that we're unknown to those that we live among, but the word emphasizes that we're not a natural or normal part of the world scene. We're on our way to heaven, and we anticipate being called there by our Savior at any moment. It could happen this year. It could happen this year. Peter was writing to a group of people just like believers today who had come into a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ by faith. And as such, they were elect. But they were also exiles, separated and made distinct from the physical, natural world in which they lived. Why? Because God had chosen them to be that. He writes in John chapter 15, verse 19, The world would love you as one of their own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you as it hated me. And it's hard sometimes for us to reconcile the reality of this truth because we live with what we see. We live with what we touch and feel and taste and smell. And difficult at times to make right decisions about our homes, about our values, about our possessions, about the things that we, we desire. But I found help sometimes in the old spiritual hymn. It's a great truth. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. There's a reading from a contemporary author in the second century who writes, Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind by either country, speech, or customs. They reside in their respective countries, but only as aliens. They take part in everything as citizens and put up with everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their home and every home a foreign land. They find themselves in the flesh, but not, do not live according to the flesh. They spend their days on earth, but hold citizenship in heaven. That was written in the second century. Would that still be true today? It sure is. Thirdly, Peter writes to those of the dispersion. God's elect, strangers in the world, of the dispersion. And the idea carries with it the scattering, used in particular of, uh, of the Jews, referring to how they were living, how they were living among the Gentiles at their, at their time. But Peter's readers were considered scattered minority groups as well, minority groups in a non-Christian world. They were living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all areas of modern-day Turkey, south of the Black Sea. Uh, Pontus was on the southern sea of the Bla- southern shore of the Black Sea, uh, on the eastern side, and the western side was Bithynia. And you came around the coast, opposite of Greece, would be, would have been the large Roman province of Asia. And along the the bottom, 
uh, southern coast of the Mediterranean Sea of, of Turkey, you would have had Galatia, and in the central area, Cappadocia, and all these areas. Uh, we're not sure of all the areas uh, and how the church was first formed there. Paul established many churches on some of his missionary journeys. Some of the areas are mentioned, some are not, but we know that's where Paul was writing to, basically the area of what we call modern Turkey today. And it's interesting and well of, of note that a well-known letter of the imperial legate Pliny the Younger to the Roman Emperor Trajan in A.D. 112 indicates that Christianity had already been entrenched in that area that I've mentioned for many years with the result that the pagan temples were almost deserted. It's true, as it's true about Paul's stay in Ephesus. It says there in Acts that the whole world was turned upside down and had come to know the gospel. Well, in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God, is how Peter begins the second stanza. He's eager now to share some encouragement and spiritual support with the, with the readers. So he begins this section with a great statement regarding the work of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And true Christianity is Trinitarian in its theology and understanding of the nature of God. John, uh, 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 Jim Samra. Uh, wrote, while the church will have to wait a few centuries to iron out the more formal language used for the Trinity, the willingness to acknowledge one God eternally existing in three divine persons comes out of passages like this one, where all three persons of the Trinity are presented together and each one fulfilling a distinct role in our salvation. The first three, there are the three prepositional phrase Phrases are used to emphasize that these elect exiles are not on their own, but they're living out their Christian faith, having a special relationship with God. And the entire Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are active in their personal Christian experiences. Paul writes according, or Peter writes according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And foreknowledge is that idea of divine understanding. Hebert writes, Divine foreknowledge involves God's favorable regard for people as part of his deliberate plans and purposes. His affectionate regard for them is not due to what they are in and of themselves, but can only be understood as a manifestation of his gracious character as God the Father. In other words, God's foreknowledge is not wrapped around who we are, but who he is and the plans that he has for us. We can see in the designation of the foreknowledge of God his infinite power, his infinite wisdom, and his goodness to choose out those that he would. And as a father, he assures them of his loving concern for their well-being and trying circumstances. God is a loving, gracious, kind, compassionate father. God the Father has planned and decreed all that is happening, all that has happened, all that will happen, all the plans for all the ages are part of the plan of, the God, of God the Father. And here the emphasis is on God's preordained plan. And this is vital that Peter wants to communicate this to those who are going through difficult times. That those suffering for being Christians understand that God is in control of all things. This is a major doctrine in scripture that we believe that there is no happenstance, there's no accidents, there's no oops in God's plan. He's not caught off guard at any time by the things that are plan the things that are happening in our world. That everything that is going on in this world and in our own world is working according to the sovereign plan of God. Whether scheduled, so called or unscheduled events, nothing is ever out from underneath God's sovereign rule. Peter also says to the, to the believers that are suffering that they are being sanctified by the Spirit of God. It's the ongoing activity of the Holy Spirit that's in reference to here. Not the eventual state of holiness that we will be in, but the day to day to day becoming more like Jesus Christ. It's an understanding of the term that is, is uh, reference to our consecration as well as our cleansing. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that sets us apart as Christians. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes what the Father, who the Father has chosen and sets them apart from the world and works out their salvation in accordance with God's plan. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And then thirdly, Peter writes, For obedience to Jesus Christ. And this is the intended outcome of God's saving grace in our lives, so that we would be obedient. 
Paul says in Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, is God's goal for us. And remember that Jesus said in John 8, 29, that he only does those things that please the Father. 1 John chapter 2 says, if we are in him, then we should walk as Jesus walked in obedience to the word of God. Obedience is that the word that means listening and submitting to what was heard. We saw that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says the difference between the wise and the foolish because they heard the same thing is what they did with what they heard, what they did with what they knew. It involves the change of attitude in the believer, Romans 12, too, that we have our mind transformed or metamorphosized from the inside out so that we might become obedient servants. It's a reversal of the characteristic and saved attitude of rebellion and self-will. So the obedience here does not refer necessarily to the initial act of our salvation, but to the continuing acts of faith and obedience because of our salvation. But even the most mature believer realizes obedience is incomplete in actual practice. One writer wrote, and I, and I like the way he put it, the sign and proof of being among the elect is not an empty pratting or boasting of how secure we are once we have believed, but rather how sensitive we are to the principle and practice of obedience to the Savior whom we have believed. Clearly, this phrase here that Peter is using is in reference that we must show after the fact of our initial salvation that we are obedient to the faith for obedience is the first act as well as the pre- uh, permanent characteristic of true faith James says it so well don't say that you're a Christian and show nothing that gives evidence of it and fourth the fourth phrase is and for sprinkling with his blood in Exodus chapter 24 at Mount Sinai after the Israelites heard God's word to them through Moses they said everything that the Lord has said we will do they made a commitment and after these words were spoken they indicated and accepting indicating their acceptance of the terms of the Mosaic covenant and their intention to obey it uh, Moses then sprinkled the altar and the people both with blood that brought them into a covenant relationship with God, and the blood symbolically sealed the covenant between them and the Lord. And Peter shares this in 1 Peter 1-2, that the, the sprinkling of the blood did not only begin the covenant relationship with Israel, but also confirmed the conduct that was to come from them, how they, re, how they regarded themselves as the covenant people of God. And so Peter tells us, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that we have all, in one sense, signed the new covenant. And we did that when we received Christ as our Savior. In receiving Christ as our Savior, then, we committed ourselves to following a life of obedience. We are new covenant keepers. The new covenant into which Peter's readers have been brought was sealed by the blood of Christ. They were sprinkled by his blood, and they received the blessings of that. This phrase for obedience to Jesus Christ not only is the initial saving power and efficacy of Jesus' blood available to us, but also the ongoing effectiveness of that blood to continually cleanse us. Believers now should be eager and obedient to to obey the revealed will of God, and we should be readily availing ourselves of the continual cleansing of his blood. At 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through uh, 1 through 10, but 1 John 1, 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. In the context there is the ongoing fellowship that we have with the Lord. And he also says in verse 9, a very familiar verse, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in this verse, Peter shares with us, we have God the Father is as the one who plans our salvation. God the Son is the one who accomplishes the Father's plan. And through his life and his death, his resurrection and his ascension, he provides salvation through his work on the cross. And God the Holy Spirit enacts and applies what Jesus has done to our lives to bring into our lives the obedience that God desires. Well, Peter gives them a greeting. He says, grace to you and peace. It's the basic Christian greeting, uh, uh, the, the basic Christian message and greeting. Grace is the unmerited favor of God bestowed upon guilty men in and, and through, in and through Jesus Christ alone. It's a witness to our sinful condition as well, for sinless people do not need grace. It involves God's provision for a sinful past and enables daily grace for Christian living. Day by day, and with each po- passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Peace, the result of having received the grace of God. 
that we have come into a state of well-being with God from our experience of being reconciled with him and forgiven. And Peter says, may grace and peace to you be multiplied. multiplied. May they be confirmed abundantly on you. Those who have received grace and peace are encouraged to call out to the Lord for more, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And so that in the increase of difficulties and persecutions and struggles and trials in our life, there would be a matching grace and peace that would accompany us through those tough times. Peter's writing to encourage and challenge and teach and remind and exhort the believers that over time he himself had learned to be faithful and to stand firm in the faith. From the times of denial at the cross, learning he had learned not to deny Jesus' name. Have you and I ever denied the Lord? Well, yes, unfortunately, we all have at times. But his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his peace is available to us. John chapter 21 tells the disciples' story. It's after the resurrection. They uh, had not been confirmed, in, or, or after the, the crucifixion, they had not been confirmed in the news that Jesus was resurrected, or if they had, they still hadn't convinced themselves that it was true. They were back fishing. They were full of fear, disillusionment, doubt. They went back to doing what they had done before Jesus. And when you don't know what to do, oftentimes you do end up doing something that you like to do, or you've been trained to do, something that you're good at doing to keep you distracted from what's truly bothering you, from what's creating stress or desire or, or distress and anxiety in your life. So they fished all night. They caught nothing, which is not a very fulfilling or pleasant experience. I, I'm not much of a fisherman, and if I'm out for about 10 minutes and don't get a bite, I'm, I'm done. But these were professional fishermen. But they would have had a very frustrating, uh, upsetting, discouraging evening. And yet the story says that Jesus called to them from the shore, Do you have any food? Do you have anything to eat? And they replied they had caught nothing. So no fish caught, no fish to eat. And so a non-fisherman, no less a carpenter, shouted to them, this is what you need to do in order to catch fish. And how do you think that bit of information would have gone over from a carpenter or a fisherman on how to fish? And yet, they did. They threw their nets on the other side of the boat. And the nets became so full of fish, they had trouble bringing them in. So what just happened? Well, for Peter, it was a miracle. The one who had denied him... Peter, the one who had deserted him at the fire, the one who had chosen to leave him again to go back to fishing, now sought the Lord with all of his heart. Peter left the safety of the boat again, and this time, instead of walking in the water, he swam in the water to Jesus. The same guy uh, who had taken his eyes off Jesus now had his sights set on the Lord. He had learned the lesson of that one story to keep his eyes on Jesus. And when suffering, not for something foolish or wrong that you and I have brought upon ourselves, but because of our faith in the Lord uh, and our choice to live for him, we will need to learn this year to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 13, 3, consider him who endured, 12, uh, Hebrews 12, 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In uh, the little book that we were referring to, The Red Sea Rules, says when we encounter difficult times and when life is not easy and the pain and troubles are great we need to teach ourselves to ask the right question and the right question is not always how can I get out of this how can I get away from this how can I stop this difficulty but ask sometimes how can God be glorified in this mess or situation that I am in this elementary truth my dear Watson is for believers as well we all go through life's troubles and the stuff of life hits us hard at times. From Genesis 3 to today, as Job said, man is born to adversity as sparks fly upward. However, Christians go through these times with a purpose. God designs these difficult times to draw us closer to Jesus and to become more like the Lord. But if you are without Jesus, then you must go through these life struggles on your own. Psalm 23 is for believers. Jesus walks with his own children. He walks with those who believe in him. He walks through life's difficulties even when they are in the valley of the shadow of death. So why would you choose to go today through life's struggles and difficulties and trials and painful situations on your own? There's no, there's no benefit in that. There's no blessing. There's no purpose. Instead, choose this morning to go through life with Jesus. For Christian, my dear Christian friends, Luke 22, Jesus reminded Peter, and I'm sure he never forgot the words, 
Simon, Simon, behold, Satan's demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So do you think today that Satan has any less of a desire for you and I to sift us, to shake us, to destroy us in the process? Christian, if you are going to try to live like the Lord this year, Satan and his minions will be on your tail. If you don't, and if you continue to pretend to be a Christian this year, then you should be fairly well off. You might have troubles and difficulties, but typically they're going to be of your own making. Or the Lord might send things to you to wake you up and call you back to himself. But most of all, Peter is writing to those Christians who like him, and the Lord is speaking to those Christians who like Peter, will fall and fail when they try it on their own to be totally committed to the Lord. And we need to know about God's grace, about his sovereignty, and about how to stand in the faith and grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. That's the author's stated purpose as we close in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. It says, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm or stand fast in it. Peter's letter-writing purpose was to establish the suffering Christian readers in their faith. So it's important for us this morning to know that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are elect. You have been chosen by God. But in this life, we are exiles, strangers, sojourners in the world today. We're loved by God and we're considered by God to be strangers and aliens still within his plan and purposes. But knowing that God is sovereign and knowing that God has called us to be exiles in this world can be very helpful in giving us hope, purpose, understanding as we anticipate the many changes uh, that we believe are coming to us in 2020 and further. What will these changes be? And how will God's plans for us work themselves out for us? What can be the effect? What will be the effects on our lives, the lives of our children, grandchildren, neighbors, friends, relatives, co-workers? It is yet to be seen. But in the meantime, fellow exiles and sojourners stand firm and fast in the grace of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words, these brief words in 1 Peter. We thank you for the message and the hope and the encouragement and the comfort hopefully they bring to each that's listening this morning. Or the challenge to recognize that if they are not walking with Jesus Christ this morning, they are alone and Satan would love to sift them, destroy them. And I pray that those who walk alone would learn to walk with Jesus. Help us, Lord, this year as believers in Jesus Christ to stand firm in our faith as exiled, elect sojourners. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.